Thank you very much for the invitation. <coughs> um, I have uh, prepared a course that I hope will um, fulfill your expectations. <coughs> it's, um, as uh, Professor Vadis uh, Kumar said, a, a course on finite elements in fluids, basically using um, stabilized finite element method. Okay? I will explain why is it so important to use stabilized finite element methods. I mean, it's, in fact, it's uh, absolutely necessary in fluid mechanics for several reasons that we will see. And uh, I will explain a particular uh, stabilized uh, finite element method, although I will also try to uh, describe briefly other uh, possibilities that can be, find, can be found in the, in the literature. Okay. So uh, first, the, the I have organized this course basically into three main blocks, which are, I think, the most important blocks. One is the, the first one is the convection diffusion reaction equation. So essentially, we will uh, devote uh, two sessions about uh, this uh, topic, convection diffusion reaction. Then I will uh, talk about the second topic, which is the Stokes problem. So the Stokes problem has uh, uh, certain features that make it very important in fluid mechanics, as, as we will see. So again, we will uh, dedicate uh, two sessions to the Stokes problem. First, to the general theory, because uh, even though it's, it looks like a simple problem, it's very rich in mathematical structure. So we will uh, uh, devote uh, two sessions to the Stokes problem as well. And finally, two more uh, sessions, maybe a little more, to the Navier-Stokes equations, the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. So th those are the, the three main blocks of, uh, of this uh, short uh, course. Um, after that, there are additional topics that are maybe not that important, but also, uh, I mean, uh, of importance in the applications. And I've chosen four of them. Uh, that depends on time, how many we will touch, if all of them, or maybe not all of them, or maybe I will add something else, we will see. But those topics are the Darcy problem, magnetohydrodynamics, and in particular Max Maxwell's problem, waves, and then the treatment of turbulent flows using these uh, techniques that we will see uh, in the first uh, part, uh, in the first main blocks, okay? So this is the idea of the organization. First, convection diffusion reaction, then Stokes, then Navier-Stokes. That is the main building block. Th those are the main building blocks. And then we will move to different topics um, that may change according to the way the course uh, proceeds. Okay. So let's start then with the first of these uh, topics, which is the convection diffusion reaction equation. And uh, we will see how to approximate that equation using finite elements. <coughs> This is the, uh, con th those are the contents of the uh, first part. First, I will talk about the instability problems of the Golurkin method, why the Golurkin method is not stable, does not uh, provide the good results in the case of Domian convection, as we will see. I will uh, use also the Stokes problem for the argumentation. So I know that you already know that, even though my main concern here is the, um, is the convection diffusion reaction equation, for the purpose of argumentation, I will also uh, refer to the Stokes problem. Then we will see a first uh, method, which is the Golurkin least squares method. It's uh, not what we use, but it's a method that was developed uh, some time ago. Um, maybe it's, that is a little bit uh, obsolete nowadays, but uh, there is a, a predecessor, which is the SUPG method, which is still used. We will also talk about that. Another possibility that can be found in the literature is to stabilize the Galerkin method using bubble functions. We will also talk about that, although that's not what we use. And then I will introduce the general framework in which we work, which is the so-called uh, subgrid scale concept in the variational multiscale method. And then we will see how these techniques, very briefly, we will see uh, why these techniques can be applied to how can be applied to the Navier-Stokes equations which will be a topic uh, of the third uh, part of the, of the main, of the main uh, part of the course. Okay, so let's uh, get into the problem. So let's uh, consider the convection diffusion reaction equation. We will see how to approximate that using uh, finite elements. First, using the so-called Golurkin method. 
uh, and then we will see uh, how to stabilize the instabilities that the Golurkin method uh, has. Okay. So we want to solve the boundary, the boundary value problem that is uh, written here. So we want to find a scalar function u such that L of u, a certain operator L that is defined here, is equal to a right-hand side f. So f is given, and L is given by this expression. Okay. So this expression has three terms. One is the diffusive term. You know all that, uh, all about this. So it's minus k Laplacian of u. So delta is the Laplacian plus a so-called convective term, which is A. A is a, a given velocity field, given, so A is a velocity field, and nabla U is the gradient of U, so A dot a gradient of U means the derivative of U in the direction of A, as you know, okay? So that's the so-called convective term. Plus a term that is linear in U, so it's just a constant or a function S times U, I have considered linear reaction here, uh, which is uh, a zero order term. So we have derivatives of order zero, derivatives of order one, and derivatives of order two. So this is a second order partial differential equation. Okay? Diffusion, convection, and reaction. Uh, I'm uh, going slowly here just to set the notation. I understand that you all know that, but I, I, I want to make sure that you under, uh, understand the notation that I use. Okay? So we want to solve this uh, equation in a domain omega. I will always use the symbol omega for the domain where we have to solve the problem. And with boundary conditions, u equal to u bar. u bar is a given function on the boundary, on the boundary gamma. So for the, for the, uh, what I intend to explain, it is enough to consider this simple boundary condition, which is, as you know, of Dirichlet type. So there are also Neumann conditions or Robin conditions or other types of conditions, but I will only consider the, the, this simple Dirichlet condition in this part. So that's enough for our purposes. So in order to have a well-posed problem, and well-posed means that the solution exists, is unique, and depends continuously on the data. The data are the uh, right-hand side f and the uh, boundary condition u bar. So in order to have a well-posed problem, we have to have uh, k positive, that diffusion, the diffusion coefficient has to be positive. I have assumed that constant. Otherwise, I should have written the, uh, this, the, the diffusive term as the divergence of k gradient of u. But I have assumed that k is constant. So uh, I have written the diffusive term just as k Laplacian of u. k has to be post constant, as I said. And um, s has to be non-negative. The reactive term has to be non-negative. It could be uh, negative in some nonlinear reaction problems. But uh, then we have to use uh, other techniques. And A is the advection velocity, uh, which uh, I assume it will satisfy divergence of A equal to 0. It's not essential. In fact, you can write a combination of the divergence of A plus uh, uh, S, or one half of the divergence of, a, S, uh, uh, divergence of A plus S. That has to be non-negative. But for simplicity, I will assume that the divergence of A, a is 0. <coughs> okay. So that is known as incompressible flow, as you probably know. I mean, we will use that uh, uh, very often. Okay. So those are the assumptions on the coefficients of this uh, of this equation. Okay. So as you know, finite elements start not from the differential form of the problem, but from the variational form of the problem, also also called weak form of the problem. Okay. How is the weak form obtained? Uh, well. Um, it is obtained in the, uh, as follows. Maybe I will do it in detail just to fix the notation. Uh, I have a piece of chalk somewhere, right? Yes, here. I, I will do it now just uh, to fix uh, the notation. So we have the equation minus k Laplacian of u plus a gradient of u plus s u equals f with the condition that u is equal to u bar on the boundary. OK, this has to holding the domain omega and this on the other. Can you see? Can you all see? <laughs> and some, so people don't see. Maybe I should write uh, larger or? OK. I'll write well, larger. So what you do is you multiply the equation by a test function v, by, a, by, a fu by an arbitrary function v, an arbitrary function v, and then you integrate over the computational domain, OK? You integrate over omega. You integrate over omega. You all know that, but uh, I want to fix the notation. I want to fix the notation, OK? 
u integral to omega n. So, the point is that here up to this point that equation holds for all v, for all, for all functions v uh, in principle without any condition. Now, uh, instead, of, um, instead of leaving that term in this way, in this form, what we do is, as you know, integrate by parts. Why? Because we want to decrease the regularity requirement on u and maybe, of course, increase the regularity requirement on v. So, how do we do that? Very easily. So, we just apply, if you, if you want uh, Green's theorem, I don't know how you have uh, called that, but uh, in fact, you don't have to remember that. You, have, you can, you can uh, redo it every time you need it. So, that is minus k. Let me use an, uh, an initial notation. Are you familiar with this notation? Di means the partial derivative with respect to xi. So this is exactly di. Okay, and that is this. The, and repeated indexes imply summation. I, I I want to introduce that because I will use this for the Navier-Stokes equations. It's uh, simpler to work in this way. Okay, so that is the Laplacian. Do you all agree that this is the Laplacian? Is that clear? No. Yes or no? Who does not understand that? Oh, no, don't be shy. <laughs> so, the di, I say that repeated indexes imply summation from one to the number of space dimensions, two or three, okay? Two or three dimensions. So, di, di of u means, so if we, if, since we are summing for all i, this is d1, d1 of u plus d2, d2 of u plus d3, d3 of u in 3D three dimensions, okay? So, and this is exactly the second derivative of u with respect to x1 twice, plus the second derivative of u with respect to x2 twice, plus the second derivative of u with respect to x3 twice. And that's the Laplace, right? So, as I said, I, I will use that notation later for Navier-Stokes, um, and that's why I want to introduce that uh, already now, okay? So, uh, let me erase that. So, once we have written this this way, we do the following trick. Well, minus k is uh, a, a constant. I take it out of the integral, and that's the integral over omega. And I do the following trick. The derivative affects only the derivative of u, but I can put it affecting v as well. So, I can write it this way. And if I write this, and I use the derivative of a product, I will have the derivative of v times the derivative of u, which does not appear here. So I simply subtract it. So I subtract that derivative, OK? I subtract that derivative, OK? It is obvious that when I take the derivative of uh, v times derivative of u minus derivative of v derivative of u, I will recover v second derivative of u which is what I want, okay? And why is it useful? Because when I have the derivative of something with respect to coordinate uh, uh, i in a domain omega, I can use Gauss theorem. And Gauss theorem states that I can replace the volume integral by the surface integral <coughs> and replacing the derivative with respect to the i coordinate by, by the ith component of the normal, okay? So, ni is the ith component of the normal. So, this is v di u, and here I have minus and minus plus k integral over omega of di v di u, okay? So, I have to erase this, okay? So here, I have uh, def I have used uh, the standard notation that the normal, the always external normal is n, which is uh, which has components n one and two or three. Of course, the the modulus is one, so that's the external normal to the computational domain omega. Okay. Okay, great. So what do we have? What is n i n i d i n i d i of u? This is equal to the n dot gradient of u, okay? So, because again, repeated indexes imply summation. This n dot gradient of u. And that can be also written as the derivative of u with respect to the normal n, 
okay, because the because the normal has a modulus one. And what is di v di u? This summing for i, always summing for i. So this is the gradient of v dot gradient of u. Okay, the, the scalar product of the gradient of v times the, the gradient of u. Okay, so altogether what we have is that this term is precisely k times the integral over omega of gradient of v gradient of u minus k integral over the boundary of v du dn. Okay. Great. So I said that uh, when I multiplied the equation by the test function v, I didn't put any condition on that. Okay, I didn't put any condition on that. Now I will put an additional condition, which will be that v is equal to zero on the boundary. Why? The reason is uh, can be seen later. But I, I take that condition first. For the moment, give it for uh, as a condition. So if I assume that v is equal to zero on the boundary, that term vanishes. That term is zero, okay? Because of this condition, that term is zero. So if this is zero, what we have is that if u is solution, if u solves solves the convection diffusion reaction equation, if u solves the convection diffusion reaction equation, then what happens is that k integral of over omega of gradient of v e gradient of u plus integral over omega of v a gradient of u plus s I suppose s is a constant integral over omega of v u is equal to the integral over of v f for all v such that v is equal to zero on the boundary. Okay. Oh, sorry, I, I have written again with the small letters. So can you read it more or less? Yes? Yeah, more or less. I have a small letter, so I'm sorry about that. OK. So I, I will raise that. And we haven't used the boundary condition yet, because I said that if you solve the convection diffusion reaction equation, which is this one, then that integral form of the equation holds for all, test, for all functions v such that they are zero on the boundary. So since I haven't used that yet, I haven't used that condition yet, I will explicitly enforce it. So we have to enforce, we also enforce u equals u bar, okay? On the boundary, on the boundary. Okay, so now the point is, why have we imposed that condition v equals 0 on the, on the boundary. Because now, if we have this condition 1, that that has to hold for all test functions v, and this condition 2, that u is equal to u bar on the boundary, then it turns out that one can show that the other implication is also true. How can you prove that? Formally, formally, so far without rigor, just formally. We can prove that just undoing the integration by part that we have done. Okay, so that condition turns out to be essential to undo the steps that we have followed and recover the convection diffusion reaction equation. So those two problems are equivalent in a certain sense. So what do I mean? I mean that solving the convection diffusion reaction equation with this boundary condition is equivalent to impose that integral form with also the boundary condition in a certain sense. In which sense are those two equations equivalent? Suppose that we want to look at this equation and see in which uh, sense does this um, equation uh, hold, okay? So that depends on you. Choosing in which sense this equation holds depends on the user, let's say. Maybe we, are, we don't want to be too abstract and we only want to consider functions that are continuous, okay? Maybe or maybe piecewise continuous. If we only want to consider functions that are continuous, we need, and, and since this must be equal to this, we need that the Laplacian of u is a continuous function. And that implies that u has to be a function w with twice the uh, continuous uh, derivative. So that means that it needs to be a C2 function, okay? 
So if we want to, make, to, to understand this condition, this equation, point-wise, in a classical sense, for example, for continuous functions, we could weaker that continuity. But for example, for continuous functions, that would require that u is a C2 function. OK. However, in which, under which conditions does this equation make sense? Well, under much weaker conditions. Why? Because since this is a number, look at the difference. This is a function, OK? This is a function f, which is equal to another function. Whereas this is just a number. This is a number, OK? Once I, I have v, I have f, I integrate. That's a number. That's a number. So that's a number equal to another number. So when we have a number, what, which is the only condition we put to have a well-defined problem? Well, that, that number is finite. <laughs> That's the only condition we put, OK? So the only condition we, ha we need here that is very clear is that those are finite numbers. So we, we, we can equate that number to this one, but they have to be finite, OK? So they have to be finite means that the integral of uv has to be finite, excuse me, finite, that the integral of uh, v a gradient of u has to be finite, over omega, uh, the integral of gradient gradient of v dot gradient of u has to be finite. Th this is the only co these are the only conditions we need, and that has to hold for all functions v, for all functions v, uh, such that v is equal to zero on the boundary. So we have to devise conditions under which these uh, uh, equalities hold, and these conditions are not unique. That's the first point you have to uh, uh, take into account. So we can, for example, we could ask for more regularity in u and less regularity in v, but at the end, we have to have this uh, integral bounded. Okay. So that's the first remark. There are different settings in which you can pose the problem. Okay. Um, we can ask um, for more regularity in one variable, less regularity in the other. <coughs> what is called uh, usually the weak formulation is to ask for the same regularity in v and u, okay? The same regularity in v and u. But there are also the uh, super weak solutions, and 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 on the other hand, there are the so-called uh, continuous uh, classical solutions and so on. But we will use only the classical weak form. If we ask for the same regularity in u and v, uh, what will we need if this is this this has the same regularity? in both arguments. So we need that, in order to have that bounded, we need u and v to be L2 functions. Why? Because we know that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the classical, uh, well, that has different names, Young's inequality or, or Schwartz inequality. That's the most classical. And if this is bounded, then we can, if this is bounded, we can guarantee that the product is bounded, OK? That, that's just. Uh, Schwartz inequality. Uh, you don't need to know that. Well, yes, you need to know that, but I am sure you know this. Okay. So that's uh, Schwartz inequality that guarantees that this is bounded. And if I look at that, I see that the gradient of u and the gradient of v also need to be L2 functions. I mean, the, the square has to be integrable. Okay. And if this is true, if this is a square integral and this is square integral, maybe I will assume that this is bounded. So in L infinity. So that will be bounded as well. So the two conditions I need are those. The two conditions I need are those. And you know that the space in which uh, the space of functions that are L2 with derivatives in L2 is called H1. Okay? It's called H1. So altogether, the conclusion is the conclusion is that that equation one makes sense. Makes sense. What does it mean? Makes sense. Makes sense means that. All the terms that appear are bounded, are finite, are computable. Okay, makes sense if both u and v belong to H1. So are functions such that they are square integrable with derivatives square integrable. Okay. Okay. So that is the space where we will look for the solution. We could have other choices. Let me insist on that. I mean. Uh, and by the way, now it's uh, sort of a fashion to consider hyperweak or superweak solutions, but uh, uh, we will restrict ourselves to the classical case. Okay, so that's the equation. Those are the conditions on the coefficients. And then I define these spaces, the space of what I will call trial solutions. 
which are functions in H1 that satisfy that condition from the very beginning. That's why the, the, the Dirichlet conditions in the weak form are called essential boundary conditions, because they have to be satisfied from the very beginning. And I define as well the space V, which are the space of functions in H1 that vanish on the boundary. That's the condition that we have seen on the function V. That will be called. Yes, it, uh, let me comment on that then. So, and, and, uh, and V, and V is uh, this, the, what I will call the space of test functions. Okay, so the space of trial solutions and the space of test functions. So you see that the only difference is that in one case V is equal to U bar on the boundary, and in the other case V is equal to zero on the boundary. Okay, that's the only difference. Of course, it is very uh, convenient uh, in the development of the theory to take to take U bar equal to zero. It's not because it's more difficult uh, U bar different from zero. It's just because uh, we have the same space as, uh, for the trial functions and the test and the test functions, which is convenient. You know, you know. The, the f everything is defined on the same space. Okay, what about uh, uh, hyperweak solutions? Those are weak. Wh why are these co solutions called weak? Because here we, we need a, a v that the unknown the unknown to be only in H one, whereas in the continuous case at, at the at the partial differential equation level, we need u to be c two for it, for instance. So with second derivatives continuous. Okay, so. Here we need the first derivatives not even continuous. We need the first derivative a squared integral. Okay, so that's much less regularity than here. That that is why it is called weak. Uh, what are the hyperweak or superweak solutions? Superweak solutions are those in which you even have less regularity. How can you uh, ask for less regularity if you look at this equation? You can ask for less regularity by passing derivatives from the unknown. You see here the unknown by passing derivatives from the unknown to the test function again. Okay? So we could integrate by parts. If we want to obtain a, a super weak solution, we could integrate by parts, pass this derivative to the test function, and here the same, pass the derivative of, uh, of, of u to the test function, and then see under which conditions do, does the uh, equation make, make sense. And then we would see in the first level of super weak uh, solutions that u needs to be only in L2, but the, then the test function has to be in H2, okay? So we, uh, uh, and then that equation would be a very strange one because if, if we have u only in L2 and we take second derivatives, it's like if the equation holds in H minus two, uh, something very uh, anyway. Uh, that's, uh, but we can make it even weaker, okay? But uh, by the way, that reminds me that I have to make another comment. <laughs> the other comment is under which conditions is the right hand side? Vf bounded. If uh, f is in L2, that is more than enough because f is in L, uh, f is in L2, v is in L2, then this is bounded. Okay, the right hand side is bounded. But what happens? It turns out that we have required the test function to be more than L2, to be in H1. Okay, to be in H1. So if this is more than L2, if this is H1. Maybe the, this f needs to be less than L2, okay? And that, in true, that in fact happens. F needs to be less than L2. In general, I don't know if you if you know that, but in general, when you uh, ask for an integral to be finite, and you have a certain function, for in, in this case v, in a space capital V. Then you say that the set of functions or the space of functions that make this integral finite is called the dual of V, okay? Because everything in, 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 in PDEs, in partial differential equations, relies on the duality provided by the integral, okay? The duality provided. I mean, there are other dualities in linear algebra, the, the duality relies usually on the classical scalar product. But in PDEs, oops, what happened? Ah, it will come, okay. But in, in, in PDEs, the duality relies always on the integral, okay? So the space of functions that, uh, that is the dual of H1, we will also encounter that, is called H minus 1. That's just notation. H minus 1 is just the space of functions that, uh, such that the integral against functions in H1 is bounded, okay? Okay, so... That's it. Thank you. 
we, we have taken a lot of time for the first slide, but we will go faster later, okay. So that's just a remark about the regularity of f. Okay, so uh, then, uh, as I said, uh, the, the, we have this equivalence that is very easy to prove. So the original problem, that problem, finding u such that L of u is equal to f, is equivalent to finding u in that space, the space of trial solutions, such that A of uv is equal to L of v for all v in the space of test functions where A is given here, that is the, the expression of A, and L is given here, okay? And as I said before, to develop the theory, it is convenient to take u equal to zero, and therefore, in that case, the space of trial solutions is equal to the space of test functions. It's just for convenience. Why? Because in that case, that function A acts on the same space on the two arguments, okay? The same space for u and the same space for v. So it's, it's just convenience. And maybe we can see what happens if we interchange the, the, the arguments. Um, that is uh, why uh, it is convenient to take u equal to zero on the bank. A is, is a form. What is a form? A form is just a mapping whose uh, space of uh, arrival, whose image space is the set of real numbers. That's a form. Since it has two arguments and it's linear in each argument, as you see, I mean, it's obviously linear in u, and it is obviously linear in V, it's called bilinear form because it's linear in each argument. Whereas L is just a linear form, okay? So you know all that notation, I'm sure. So that's the weak form of the problem. Finding U in the uh, function in the function in the trial solution space such that that equation holds for all test functions V. Okay? So you know that that's exactly the same as you have seen for uh, Poisson's problem. The only difference is that now we have this convective term and maybe this reactive term, and I have done that in detail just to set the notation. Okay. Which is the key point to prove that the uh, solution exists, is unique, and depends continuously on the data? The key point is that Poincare Friedrich's inequality. That states the following there exists a constant such that the gradient of u can oh, bounce from above the L2 norm of v for all functions v. Let me explain which is the meaning of this inequality. It's very simple. It's very easy to understand, but it is crucial. You have seen that, right? I, I will just uh, insist on, on the meaning. So what does that mean? It means that if I, in fact, the way to understand that is the following is that if I am able to prove that the L2 norm of the gradient is bounded, then I can assure that the gradient, the L2 norm of V is also bounded. In fact, that's the, implica the, the important implication of that condition. Well, also in this form is important, but in this case it's important. So if I control derivatives, I control the function as well. If I can provide control on the derivatives, I can provide control on the function. That's what it means. And of course, it is essential that uh, we have v, or the unknown, whatever it is, the function v, uh, controlled on the boundary. Of course, that not, does not hold in general, but only if, uh, if v is zero or, or given on the boundary. Why? Because if we control the derivatives, imagine in one case it's very easy to understand. If we control the derivatives, the function cannot grow uh, as much as it wants. The function cannot grow much if we are able to bound the derivatives. So we have to have derivatives bounded. Okay, derivatives bound. But if we don't have control on the function on the boundary, if we don't know the value of the function on the boundary, we could move that uh, upwards and, and downwards. Okay? So we would not have control on the L2 norm of the function itself. So the only way to have control on the L2 norm of the function is to know which are the boundary values, for example, zero. Okay? So this result is very intuitive, but as soon as we know the boundary values of the function u. Okay? Good. Um, that's the so-called poincare friedrichs inequality. By the way, I know that in, in mathematics, very often, people don't care about units, which is a big mistake, I guess. Uh, why do I think it's a big mistake? 
because in fluid mechanics in general, in all uh, mathematical physics, uh, units matter, and they matter a lot. Why? Because if we want to prove existence and uniqueness of that problem, it doesn't matter whether k is large or small, or v, a is large or small, or s is large or small. It doesn't matter. Anything that is uh, smaller than infinity <laughs> works. However, when you put it uh, in a computer, it's very important which is the number that you are dealing with. Why? Because 10 to the 10 is infinity, you know, and 10 to the minus 10 is zero. So it's not true that any number works, and that's that's the key of everything. You know, the key of uh, of all instabilities at the numerical level is that numbers matter. Okay, numbers matter. Okay, if numbers matter, if numbers matter, units matter. Why? Because if you change units, you want to make sure that all the terms in the equation scale properly. Okay, so it cannot be, uh, you cannot accept that uh, you have a method in which uh, uh, things depend on, uh, on units, because if you change units, you change the solution. That's unacceptable. Okay. Units matter. So I will often refer to units, and in particular, which do you think are the units of C? That constant C that depends on omega has units. W which are the units of C? Which would you think are the units of C? By the way, is it normal to ask to the students or not? <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody know which are the units of C? So you need to think of V as any function, temperature, whatever, concentration, pressure, whatever. It doesn't matter. So the units of V would cancel with the units of V here. So okay, units of V don't matter. But what happens when you take the gradient of a function? What units or which units does that differentiation introduce? One over? Well, one over length, and then you have a square here, right? That's ex perfect. So the derivative uh, introduces a, u a unit one over length, because that derivative is a derivative in space. If that could be a derivative in time, that would introduce uh, a unit of one over time. OK, perfect. So one over length squared. So that constant has to have units of one over length squared. OK, great. Because, by the way, we, al we also have the same norm. So the, the L2 norm also has units. Okay, the L2 norm. Which units does the L2 norm introduce? If I have a function f and I take the L2 norm of that function, what units does the L2 norm introduce? That's not that easy, is it? <laughs> Imagine a, 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 a clue. Uh, imagine you are in, dimen in d dimensions, d equal 2 or 3. So uh, the, 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 it depends also on the number of dimensions, either it is 2 or 3. What do you do? You take the function, you square it, you integrate it. What units does integration introduce? What? L to the power of d, perfect. Integration introduces units L to the power of d. And then when you take the square root, d over 2, exactly. So integration, the L2 norm, when you take the L2 norm, introduces units of L to the power of d over 2. I mean, the LP norm introduces units of L to the power of d over p. Okay? But that, that those units are introduced on the left-hand side and also on the right-hand side. So that's why they don't count. Okay? OK, so that constant, in fact, uh, it's a constant that depends on the units that you use, on the size of the domain. OK, okay. <clears throat> then the remark is that from this, uh, it's a trivial remark, this one. From these results, it follows that controlling the L2 norm of the gradient of V, you control the whole H1 norm. What is the H1 norm? The H1 norm of a function is the sum of the L2 norm plus the L2 norm of the gradient. So, of course, you have this inequality, and then if you control the gradient, you control the whole H1 norm. Okay? Okay, so that's a result. Then a result that you also know from Poisson's problem, but uh, that uh, is extended here to a general bilinear form. So, 
given a bilinear form defined on in principle two different spaces it is continuous if and only if there exists a constant such that a is bounded by that constant times the norm of u in the space where it belongs v and the norm of w in the space where it belongs w okay so this is a result that is apparently innocent what does that mean it means that a is continuous if you can bound it by essentially the norm of u and the norm of b that would be trivial in finite dimensions okay that could be trivial in, in finite dimensions if a is defined on rm cross rn it is obvious that it is continuous if this holds okay however this is a a deep result i wouldn't say it is a very deep result but it's a deep result in in finite dimensions because these spaces are in finite dimensional or functional spaces so in finite dimensions it turns out that the bilinear form is continuous if and only if it is bounded because you know what it means if you can bound the form by the arguments it is said that the form is bounded or in general a functional if you can bound a function by the by the argument by the norm of the argument that's the definition that the that the uh, uh, functional or the form is bounded so it says that uh, a bilinear form is bounded if and uh, it if and only if it is continuous it is not trivial at all so it's uh, in finite dimensions it's ridiculous it's it's uh, very obvious it's trivial but in infinite dimensions this is a, a very a very deep result well an important result and then a definition that you know and you see in that case it is com it is necessary for that definition to make sense it is necessary that the two spaces are the same you know a acts on the same space on the two arguments so we say that a bilinear form is coercive if there exists a constant that I call k such that when the two arguments are equal, a of vv is greater or equal a constant times the norm of this in the proper space, the norm of v to the power of 2. Okay, the square of the norm of v to the power of 2. This is called coercivity, as you know. Okay, great. So we have these two results. That, well, well, this is a, a, a result from functional analysis, and this is a definition. However, we will not use that definition. Well, sometimes we will use this weaker definition, which has the following. We say that a form is V-stable, which means stable in the first argument, if there exists a constant such that the infimum of the supremum of A normalized by the norm of V and the norm of W is greater than a constant. I, we, we will talk a lot about that condition. So. Uh, don't worry if you uh, don't know it, because we will talk a lot about that. Let me just uh, uh, start talking about it. So first, that uh, norm dividing is just a normalization, if you want. That's the first point. So what is the inf and what is the sup? <coughs> uh, in finite dimensions, the inf is the mean and the sup is the max, of course. In infinite dimensions, it could happen that, that the minimum is reached for a function that, that does not necessarily belong to the space. So that's why instead of calling it min, we call it inf, the infimum. Okay? And likewise, the maximum may be reached for a function that lies outside w. So that, that's why we call it, instead of calling it uh, the, the, sup, we, or the max, we call it the, sup, the supremum. Okay? So inf and, ma uh, inf and sup are, let's say, technical. Um, are, I mean, uh, max, in, mean and max are replaced by infant soup just for technical reasons in infinite dimensional spaces. That's where we are working now. Okay, so we will call a form A stable if that holds. Okay, that in fact will be the key condition for everything because this is the, this is the key condition in in in, in variational problems. However. <coughs> Uh, we can you can use this weaker condition with this weaker condition for the moment we will see that this condition is weaker and prove that result that you probably already have which is lax milgram's theorem which, which says the following the problem of finding a function u in a certain space such that a of u v is equal to l of v for all functions v has a unique solution if these three properties hold okay these three properties hold so the first property is that A is continuous. Usually this is trivial to prove. Okay? A is continuous, which is equivalent, as we said before, 
uh, to say that A is bounded. That is easy to, to, to prove, usually in the applications. The second is that L is continuous. That is also easy to prove. And finally, the key point is that A is coercive. Okay, if these three conditions hold, then the solution exists, is unique, and is bounded by these constants. The norm of L, that constant can be defined as the norm of L, divided by the coercivity constant of K. Okay? And now, as I, I said that the important condition is this one, is this one. but le let's, let's understand, let's try to understand what that condition means, the coercivity. The coercivity. And to understand what that condition means, we will think that we have discretized the problem, or if not, that we are working in a finite dimensional space. So imagine we have the problem A of uv equals to L of v for all functions v in our space v. And suppose for a moment that the space v is finite dimensional. Imagine that v is Rn for a moment, okay? If V is Rn, uh, in fact, the same happens if we are working in the discrete case, I can express U as Ui times Ei, summing for I, where I, always summing for I, where E is the basis function, okay? E is the basis function, and U, I are the components of U in the basis E, okay? And likewise, I can express V as Vj, Ej. Again, summing for j. Summing from here, the summation would be from i equals 1 to the number of dimensions n. And the same there. So a of uv would be equal to a of ui, ei, vj, ej. And that would be equal, since a is linear, I can take out the, co the, the, the components uh, ui and vj, and that would be equal to ui uh, a of ei ej vj vj okay and i can define this i can define this to be the components ji it is convenient to write that as ji of a certain matrix capital a okay and if i introduce that notation i can write a of uv as the vector v transpose times a times u where now v, maybe I could put an underscore to, to denote that this is a vector, okay? The components of which are vj. And this is also a vector, the components of which are ui, okay? And a is a matrix, that's why I have put two underscores on it. And similarly, L of v is equal to L of vj ej, and that is equal to vj L of Ej, and I can write that as Fj, the components J of a certain vector, and that can be written as V transpose tan times F, a vector V um, transpose, the same vector is here, V transpose times a certain vector F, okay? And collecting what I've done, that problem in the finite dimensional case can be written as V transpose times A times u equals to v transpose times f. And if that has to hold for all functions v, that has to hold for all vectors v in Rn. Okay? Good. In the finite dimensional case, that's what we have. And what does that mean, coercivity? Coercivity says that a of v, v is greater or equal a constant times the adequate norm of v squared. What happens if we take the two arguments equal in the finite dimensional case? We would have v transpose a v greater or equal a certain constant, let me call it k underscript a capital, times the norm of v squared. And when does this happen? What is the estimate for this Ka? If, I, if that has to hold for all vectors V, 
What do you think Ka will be? Or in other words, Ka will be is, uh, at least what? The what? Who said that? Exactly. Exactly. The minimum value of the You were also right. It's a, a certain estimate of the norm of A. But A, Ka, is a, a, a lower bound for the minimum lambda belonging to the spectrum of A. So the, the, the minimum eigenvalue of A. Okay. If the eigenvalues exist, because uh, maybe we could put it in if the eigenvalues exist. Okay. But if not, is a is a is a lower bound for the minimum eigenvalue. And if we are asking that constant to be positive, if we are asking that constant to be positive, that's, that's what coercivity means. We are saying that matrix A has to be how? If all eigenvalues are positive, sorry, exactly, exactly. Coercivity, A coercive, you have to think of that as asking the matrix associated to that in the finite dimensional case it is exact in the finite dimensional case think of a discretization of it a is positive definite okay so that's what coercivity means maybe i could ad uh, advance a little bit about the meaning of that the first, the, the, the other condition that's, that I said is the crucial one, which is, which is this one. We will again talk about this. But coercivity means, as we have seen, roughly speaking, that matrix A is positive definite. So asking, of course, that is a sufficient condition. The problem of finite has a unique solution if, not if and only if, if. So those are sufficient conditions for having a solution that is unique and well posed. However, that is not a necessary condition. What happens to be a necessary condition is this one. Why is it sufficient but not necessary? Let's think about the original, the, the algebraic problem. The algebraic problem, of course, that algebraic pro problem becomes uh, uh, AU equals to F. Okay with the notation that I introduced before. Of course, having a unique solution requires what on matrix A? What is the condition that we need on matrix A to have a unique solution? Invertibility. And of course, if it's positive definite, is it invertible? Yes, it is. All eigenvalues are non-negative, are positive, by the way, not zero. Not zero. There are no zero eigenvalues. But is it necessary? to have a positive definite matrix, to have an, a solvable problem? No, it is not. What is the condition that we really need to have an invertible matrix? What is the condition, the necessary and sufficient condition for having an invertible problem? Which is, which one? Non-singular. Non-singular, in terms of eigenvalues, if they exist, means Non-zero eigenvalues, exactly. Non-zero eigenvalues. We don't need the eigenvalues to be positive. We need two eigenvalues to be not zero. OK, so that condition, that stringent condition, means essentially that we are requiring all eigenvalues to be positive. Whereas that condition, we will see, that means that we are requires all eigenvalues to be not zero. So that is the condition we really need, not the coercivity. It's, I mean, the coercivity is very easy to check, but it's not uh, necessary. It's asking too much, you understand? The true condition we need is that one, in the same sense as the true condition we need for the algebraic case is to have not zero eigenvalues that are not zero, non-zero eigenvalues, OK? OK. And that's what this condition means. That condition, that theorem, that is not difficult, but that requires uh, uh, some time, that is due to Babuchka, states that the problem of finding a solution such that um, A of UV is equal to for all functions has a unique solution, 
if A is continuous and V is A, is uh, excuse me, and this V is stable, and L is continuous. So it's, we don't need uh, coercivity, so we can replace the condition of coercivity by the condition of V stability, which is that one written here. That theorem is due to Babuchka. Okay? That theorem is due to Babuchka. In fact, it's just a, a direct consequence of a theorem in functional analysis, analysis by, by Banach, by, by Nekas, by Nekas, which in turn is a direct consequence of a theorem by Banach. So sometimes that condition, that theorem is also called uh, um, Banach, Nekas, Babuchka. In fact, in some uh, later on, I think I call it uh, uh, Banach, Nekas, Babuchka. Okay, perfect. Good. Then there is another result that is written here that I think you have uh, you have uh, proved you have seen that is the so-called uh, Theas uh, lemma or Theas theorem. It says the following: It's an approximation property. Suppose that we have a finite dimensional subspace of V of dimension n, and we consider the problem instead of considering the original problem a of u v equal to l of v, we consider the problem a of u n v n equal to l of v n for all test functions it's restricted to the finite dimensional space then that property holds true this is very important and in fact maybe i will explain that in some more detail so we have the original problem a of uv uv equals l of v for all functions v in the test function v and u belonging to v, of course, such that time. So we have this problem. And that problem is posed in a certain space v. Let's draw the space. That's our space v. So uh, that's the original problem. And now we replace that problem by a problem of finding a certain function un in vn such that a of un vn is equal to l of vn for all vn belonging to Vn. So that means that we are taking a subspace Vn of dimension n of V subspace and we solve this problem. Okay? We restrict both the solution and the test function to that space Vn. Okay? Then it turns out that we have this bound. It turns out that U minus Un is in the norm of the space V, in the norm of the space V is a smaller or equal the continuity constant of A divided by the coercivity constant of A, either the coercivity or the inf constant of A, times the inf of U minus Vn in the norm of V. And let's take a look at this result and see what it means. Let's use technology. Yellow chalk. What does the inf of u minus un means? Imagine that the exact solution u lies here. This is u. Okay? This is u. What is the inf of u minus vn? So that means that the, the inf for all functions vn, of course, for all functions vn. Essentially, the inf, that infimum, that minimum, if you want, Again, the reason why we say it's an infimum is because it may not be reached. So that's why it's the minimum value which may not be reached by function v. So that's why it's called infimum instead of minimum. So what is this? This is, I compute for, for all functions uh, vn in v, in, in capital vn, I compute the distance to u. That is the distance to u. And then I take the minimum. So that minimum will be, well, maybe it's not... Uh, orthogonal, so it's just that minimum, okay? Imagine this is the function Vn that for which the, in, the, the inf is, is perhaps, the infimum is uh, satisfied, okay? So we take the minimum. So what is that? That is precisely the distance, that is the distance, distance from Vn to the solution u. Okay? That's the distance from Vn to the solution u. And what does that say? Imagine this is a constant. Imagine this is given. Imagine this is given. What is u minus un? Un is the solution to my problem in the space Vn. So un is here. 
u n is here. Okay. So what this result says is that the distance from this, the exact solution u to the approximate solution u n is not equal to the minimum distance, but is equal to the minimum distance times a constant. Okay, times a constant. So if I manage to get this, that distance go to zero, that will also go to zero. Right? If this goes to zero, if, if I choose n so that when n, for example, increases, this goes to zero, that will go to zero at the same rate. That's why this result is said to be optimal. As soon as you have a, an approximation result that states that the solution to your problem behaves as the distance of your finite dimensional space to the exact solution, this is said to be optimal. Okay? If you find that, it's optimal. However, however, there is a constant here. And that constant is precisely the continuity of A. That's great. No problem about that. The continuity of A, this is usually easy to prove, divided by the coercivity constant of A. Either the coercivity constant or the in sub constant. Okay? Here is where we uh, may get into trouble. Why? Because if the coercivity constant of A is very small, it doesn't mean that that result will be false. It will be true, but useless. It will be a, a, the, that result will still be true, but will be useless. Imagine this is 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 10. Okay, that's true, but useless. Completely useless at the numerical, from the numerical point of view. Why? Because if, I am, if somebody tells me that the distance of my solution to the exact solution is smaller than 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 10 times the distance of the finite dimensional space to the exact solution, that is saying nothing. That is useless. Okay? And that's what happens with the convection diffusion reaction equation when diffusion is very small. And that's what we will see now. So that result is true. And by the way, it's not difficult to prove. It's very easy to prove. You can do it as an exercise. It's very simple. Um, it, it's, it's true for the convection diffusion equation, but useless. Well, that is easy. What comes in this slide is easy because it's the Galerkin finite element approximation of the problem that you already know. So what is the Galerkin finite element approximation? It is nothing but a particular way to construct that dim finite dimensional space Vn, okay? That we call it Vh, as usual in finite elements. So what, how we construct VH in the case of finite element? First, we construct a finite element partition of the domain omega. So it has to be a partition of triangles or quads in 2D, of tetrahedra or hexahedra in 3D. Sometimes the elements are called also K. I very often call them K as a generic element, the element domain. And then H uh, is the diameter of the partition, which is the maximum of the diameter of the element domain uh, omega E. Okay, okay, if you want. That's up to you. And then from H, uh, we, well, excuse me, from the partition, we construct the finite element approximation um, by assuming that the function is piecewise polynomial. The key of the finite element method, the key, the, 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 the characteristic, the main feature of the finite element approximation is that within each domain of the finite element partition, we assume the function to be a polynomial function. Okay, that's the key. And uh, I don't know if, uh, I, uh, do you know what the shape functions are and the nodal values and all that in the, in the, in the general 2D case or 3D case? Or I should insist a little more on that or not? Okay. So the idea is the following. In the, in the finite element case, in the finite element case, what we do is we interpolate. We, we first of all consider a partition of the domain into uh, subdomains that are called elements, okay? That are called elements. So, a partition of the subdomain. So, this is a very coarse partition, of course. Um, anyway, I, I, I will finish. Yeah, okay. So, that's, we partition it. Now, the idea of the finite element method, the key idea of the finite element method, the most important one, is that we consider within each subdomain, within each subdomain, for example, k, sometimes I call it omega e, sometimes I call it k, 
within each domain k, the function u approximated, the approximated functions that I denote by uh, within each element k to be a polynomial, a polynomial of degree whatever, of degree p, okay, degree little k, okay, a polynomial of degree k. In the case of quads, in the case of quads, instead of being a polynomial of degree k, we consider a polynomial in each direction of, of degree k, anyway, of degree k. That's the, the key point, okay? And now, if I have a polynomial of degree k in each element, in each uh, subdomain, uh, I can interpolate that from the basis functions of polynomials. And there are many ways to construct the basis functions. So you could do it. Now what comes could be done in different manners. But the most classical one is to approximate the function within, uh, within in domain, in this case, for example, in the case of triangles, by functions n1 of x times values n1 of x plus n2 of x u2 of x plus n3 of x u3 of u3 in such a way that ui u uh, a are, is precisely equal to the function at node a so this is a particular choice it's not a must but it's the most common one okay it's the most common one. What does that mean? It means that we take the values of the function at the vertices of the triangle as the components of the expansion of the unknown u in, poly in terms of polynomials. If we do that, if we do that, it's um, those functions n1, n2, and n3 are the following: are functions that have to take the value one at, at, the, at, the, at, at in this case at node one and zero at the other nodes, okay? Why? Because, so let me plot those functions. Imagine this is the triangle, this is the triangle, and I have a function that takes the value one here and zero at the other nodes, okay? What will happen? It will happen that u of x, when x is node one, will be equal to one times u one plus zero plus zero. So precisely, u at node 1 will be equal to u1. No? Yes. And similarly, the function n2 of x will be a function that will take the value 1 at node 2 and 0 at the other nodes. OK? Have you ever seen that? Or uh, who hasn't, hasn't seen that ever? So that's not the first time you see that, right? For any of you, you have all seen that sometime before, yes? No, you haven't seen that. You have seen that. Okay. So this is very important because then we can write in general u x as the sum of these functions, which are the basis functions, times the nodal values, summing for all a. Now, these functions, these coefficients, are called nodal values in this case because are precisely the values of the unknown at the nodal points. And these functions are called shape functions in the context of the finite element method, but are nothing but the basis functions of this polynomial expansion. Okay? But in the finite element context, are called shape functions. Okay. Uh, this is obviously true for a scalar function. If that is a vector function, those nodal values would be vector values. Okay? For example, in the case of the velocity, those, those components will be vectors. That's the first remark. The second remark is that uh, this is, as I said before, not the only possibility. I mean, we could interpolate in terms of the nodal values, but also in terms of other variables. And sometimes it is useful. So we, can, we could interpolate in terms of the derivatives, for example. But uh, for the moment, it is enough to, under, to assume that we interpolate in terms of the nodal values. That interpolation has a very a, a property that is very important and that makes the finite element method very efficient, which is this property. I mean, it, what I will say seems very simple, what I will say now, but is the key for the success of the finite element method. We said that we need u to be in H1. That's what we said, right? And we said 
when I stated Sea's lemma, that that space, the approximating space that now we will call VH, has to be contained in V. There are other possibilities, by the way. Nowadays, for example, uh, another fashion is to use the so-called discontinuous Golurkin method, in methods in which the approximating space lies outside my final domain space. But I am, I, I'm going to consider only uh, th these approximations that are called conforming approximations. So if you consider conforming approximations, <coughs> and you want UH to be in a certain space of H1, no, my unknown in a certain space of H1, I want UH to be in H1. I want UH to be in H1. And as I said, UH will be piecewise polynomial. So I have a function that is piecewise polynomial and that needs to be in H1. So what would happen if UH is discontinuous? What happens if UH is, think in 1D now, you can think in 1D. Imagine you have a discontinuous function. Okay? How does the derivative behave? How does the derivative of a discontinuous function behave? It behaves like what? Imagine you know what the heavy side function is, the function that takes the value zero everywhere, except that zero until it is one and then it's one everywhere. That's the heavy side function, right? The some called the step function or I don't know how you call it. What is the derivative of the step function or the heavy side function? The Dirac delta function, exactly. So the, the in general, roughly speaking, the derivative of a discontinuous function behaves as a Dirac delta function. Is the Dirac delta function a square integrable? No, it's not. Is it integrable? Is the Dirac delta function, it's not a function, it's a distribution, but is it integrable? Yes, it is. The Dirac delta function is integrable. The integral of the Dirac delta, the standard Dirac delta function has integral 1. So it's obviously integral. But the square of the, of the Dirac delta function is not integrable. And we want the square of the derivatives to be integrable. So if u, uh, were discontinuous, it wouldn't be in H1. Bottom line, uh has to be continuous. OK? If I, if I want this property, I need uh to be continuous in this problem. Right? So how can I make sure that UH is continuous? Very easily. In that case, it's very easily. How can I do it? Just by sharing the nodal values, the values between neighbor elements. If those two elements share the nodal values, I can guarantee that the solution will be continuous across the edge. Why? Because think about the linear case linear elements, linear polynomials. If I have a polynomial, a linear polynomial that takes a given value at those two edges, and that value is the same both from this element and from this element, I can guarantee that the solution will be continuous across the whole edge. You follow that? This is called, uh, this is said, uh, it is said that uh, polynomials of degree P1 are one a uh, two unisolvent. That means that two degrees of freedom, two values, define uniquely the uh, function um, in that case across the edge. Okay. So all that, all that I'm saying now, just talking, are general properties of the finite element. Very basic, but I, I, I just wanted to recall that. Okay. Do you have any question about that? So. The key point why the finite element method is so efficient it, it, is that it's very easy, very easy to impose continuity. For example, another method of variational type is the spectral method, in which essentially there are some slight differences, but the essentially the main difference is that instead of taking polynomials, one takes, for example, uh, harmonic functions uh, as interpolation functions. With harmonic functions, it's not that easy to guarantee continuity across uh, uh, interfaces. That's why, in, in the case of uh, spectral methods, it's not that easy to construct partitions this way and, and, 
and guarantee that the solution is continuous. Okay, but with the finite element method, it is easy. Okay, so let's move on. <coughs> so that just that explains this uh, this uh, slide or this expansion. That's the expansion of u in terms of the shape functions and the nodal values, and the same for the test function. We can expand the test function in terms of the shape functions and the nodal values of the shape functions. Okay. If we do that, then it's exactly the same that I wrote before. The bilinear form applied to the unknown uh and the test function vh can be written as uh, this array of nodal values of the test function times a matrix A times the array of nodal values. And similarly for the, for the linear form L. And altogether, when the solving the problem A of uh vh equal to L of vh for all vh uh, amounts to say that A of u is equal to f. Uh, and we have to solve for u. So we have to solve for the nodal values of u. Okay? So that's the, uh, the uh, practical implementation of the finite element method. Okay, now, now it comes uh, the explanation of why it is not uh, guaranteed that the Golerkin method will work for the convection diffusion reaction equation. Okay, let's see how. Uh, the, the, the convergence of the finite element approximation in that for that equation. Suppose that u h tilde is the finite element interpolant of u. What is the finite element interpolant of u? Well, uh, the idea is the following. The idea is that you have a continuous solution. Now that you have seen that, we have a continuous solution defined on, on the domain omega. And that continuous solution takes certain nodal values, certain nodal values that are exact, so to speak. Okay. I mean, we can define them if the solution is continuous. If the solution is not continuous, then we have to define appropriately the interpolant. Okay? But suppose that the solution is continuous, and then we can define the values of the exact solution at the nodes. From the values of the exact solution, the exact nodal value solution at the nodes, we could construct a function similar to this one, but with the exact nodal values. Okay? With the exact nodal values. That's what we will call the uh, interpolant of U. Right? To understand what the interpolant is. So the interpolant has the nodal values exact. If the function is not continuous, it requires some more elaboration, but not, not, it's not very difficult. So what do we know from Seas lemma? From Seas lemma, we know that the difference between u and the finite element solution in the norm of the space where we work is bounded by that constant times the minimum or the infimum of u minus uh, vh. And of course, since that function u tilde is a particular function in my space vh, that minimum, that infimum, will be smaller than u minus uh. Okay? So, uh, by the way, just one question. I suppose the, 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 they can have the, the PDF of uh, what I'm, the slides, okay? So, um, so um, that function, uh, that, that that says that u minus uh, so that would be the error of my finite element solution, that can be defined as the error of the finite element solution, will be bounded by a constant times the difference between u and the interpolant of u. So, as I said, that can be considered optimal. Okay? So, okay, my solution, my finite element solution that I will compute will behave as the error between the solution and the interpolant of the solution. That is, that is good. However, what happens with this constant, the continuity constant of A and the coercivity constant of A? What about the continuity constant? A of uv is equal to this expression we have seen. And of course, if I use Schwartz uh, inequality everywhere, I have that this is bounded by k times the norms of the gradient, the norms of the gradient test function. The, let's say the infinity norm, that means the maximum of A times the norms of the gradient, the norm of V, as the norm of U and the norm of V. And of course, that those norms are bounded by the norm of H1, which is my work in a space. But here I have the coefficient K, the coefficient A, and the coefficient S. In fact, there are lengths, length scales everywhere, but uh, I have omitted them. Okay? But there are length scales everywhere. Therefore, the continuity constant of A behaves as, in fact, more than equal, behaves as K plus A plus S. That's the continuity constant of A, of the bilinear form A. 
Whereas what happens with the with the um, with the coercivity constant? Oh, things are not that nice here. The coercivity constant behaves as follows. It can be shown. I leave it as an exercise. It's late, so I leave it as an exercise. It can be shown that this is zero. Check it. J just use integration by parts. It can be shown that this term is zero. U a gradient of u happens to be zero. Let give me the clue. The clue is that of course u gradient of u is the gradient of u squared divided by two. And now use the fact that the divergence of a is zero, so that you can write uh, a gradient of u squared as the divergence of a times u squared over two. And then apply Gauss theorem and move the divergence as a, as a boundary, uh, transform the vo volume integral into a boundary integral, and then use that u is equal to zero on the boundary. So it's very easy. But uh, that is zero. That happens to be zero. So this is equal, that's, not a, that's equal to k norm of gradient of u squared plus s L2 norm of u. And if I, I, want, I want that to be greater or equal the h1 norm, I only can rely on this term because that term does not contain derivatives, so this is greater or equal uh, k times the Poincare Friedrich inequality times the gradient of b squared. Of, and then, and then from this we see that the co the coercivity constant is proportional to k times the the Poincare Friedrich constant. Therefore, the quotient and the norm of a and a divided by the coercivity constant behaves in this way. So, Seas lemma is always true, but what happens with this estimate? What happens is that it behaves as k plus a plus s divided by k. And the problem, of course, happens when k is very small, either compared to a or compared to s. In the case k is small compared to a, this is called convection dominated case. In the, k, in the case k is small compared to s, is called reaction dominated case. Of course, all has to be measured in appropriate dimensionless numbers. Okay, so I said at the beginning that units matter, and here um, I haven't introduced units, but uh, that has to be measured in appropriate dimensionless numbers. Um, okay, so we know that the problem is not that the the, the, the estimate is is not true; is that it's useless, as I said before. But we can still work as, as if it were use, uh, useful, but it's not. Um, when, when it's not useful? When k, for example, is uh, in dimensionless numbers 10 to the minus 8. So that is nothing. Okay? That, that, that means nothing. In fact, 10 to the minus 2 is already difficult. I mean, well, that depends on, on the problem. We will see that. OK. Uh, now there is another result that comes from, from this property, or if you want, from this one. So it would be very nice to know which is the error I'm doing, to know which is the difference between u minus uh, to know that error. I would like to know which is this error. And what is the difference between estimating this and estimating this? It's conceptually, it's completely different, conceptually. Why is it completely different to estimate that and to estimate that? Because uh is the solution of my problem, my, my, my partial differential equation. And u is the solution to the partial differential equation. But once I have a function u, estimating u minus uh tilde, the interpolant, is not related to any problem. So I have a given function u, I compute the finite element interpolation of u, and I want to estimate the error, regardless of this problem I'm solving. So this is a problem in partial differential equations, if you want, and this is a problem in interpolation theory. You see that it's completely different. So that's a problem in, in interpolation theory. So in a sense, uh, that moves the ball from estimating the error in PDEs to estimate the error in interpolation theory. Okay, so I have to estimate the error in interpolation theory. So how does the error, uh, this error behave? Well, that's the basic estimate. Okay, this is the basic estimate that uh, you have to know. It says that the error between any function v with that belongs to hr minus the interpolation of that function in the space hm that those are this is the space of functions such that the derivatives of order up to m 
belong to L2, as you know, that error is bounded by a constant, which is dimensionless, without units, times the semi-norm of V with this index, times h to the power of this index. So, suppose for a moment that r is very large, that we have as regularity as you want. r is very large. If r is very large, the minimum between these two quantities is this one. Okay? So, mu would be the polynomial order plus 1, the polynomial order plus 1, minus the derivatives you are taking. So, that power, that power of h would be the polynomial order plus 1 minus the derivatives you are taking. So, in the case of taking no derivatives, the, the L2 norm, the order would be k plus 1. Okay? k plus 1. Polynomials of degree 1 would give me a quadratic estimate. So, h to the power of 2. Polynomials of degree 2, a cubic estimate, and so on. But, if I take one derivative, I will lose one power of h. If I take two derivatives, I will lose two powers of h and so on. Is it clear? And here, the semi-norm I have is the semi-norm, if r is very large, the semi-norm is k plus 1. And you see, units match. Look, imagine r is very large. So, I have here the semi-norm, uh, excuse me, the semi-norm is just the L2 norm of the derivatives of order k plus 1. Not of the, the sum of all the derivatives, but only the derivative of order k plus 1. That's the semi-norm, okay? Only the L2 norm of the last derivative. Okay, so uh, you see that units match. That's a way to remember that estimate, for example. If I have uh, derivatives of order k plus 1 here, k plus 1, if I have derivatives of order 0, no derivatives, every derivative introduces a power 1 over length. So, that introduces a power 1 over length to the power of k plus 1. So, to make things uh, uh, dimensionally consistent, that has to be h to the power of k plus 1. Okay? Because that is length to the power of k plus 1 that cancels with the length to the power of k plus 1 introduced by the derivative. Okay? If I have one derivative more here, I will have one power of h less here, and so on. Okay? That happens if r, if the solution v is very smooth. So that means that r is very large. What happens if r is not large? If we have a solution that is only in H2, for example, the only thing that happens is that we have to restrict the validity of that estimate to the maximum regularity of the solution v. If the solution v is only in H3, I can only that will only happen up to r equal 3. So, I cannot, I cannot take uh, derivatives of order higher than 3. And if that holds only up to r equals 3, that power will be r minus the number of derivatives I'm taking. So, that is only a restriction if we are restricted by the uh, regularity of the function v. If I combine this estimate, I combine this estimate with, uh, in fact, uh, with this one, or if you want with this one, I combine th this estimate with the other one, I have this result that the solution to my problem in H1 behaves as that constant times C, uh, a dimension that is a unit, uh, dimensionless constant, H to the power of K, the polynomial order, times the semi-norm K plus 1 of the exact solution U. That's it. That is the exact solution. I don't mind how the exact solution is. It's the solution to my problem. This is not numerical approximation. This is the given solution. Okay. And there is a result that, that is more or less trivial. This is, uh, oh, no, no, I don't have it proved here. But uh, it can be shown. Why, why do I get that result almost for free? I get that result almost for free from Seas lemma because H1 is the function where I'm working. Uh, excuse me, the functional space, the space where I am working. I'm working in H1. We, de we decided to work in H1 because this is the space in which the problem is well defined. And that's why I get that from Seas lemma. However, you can work a little more, you can work a little more, and obtain not only an estimate in H1, but also an estimate in L2, 
And it happens that that estimate in the two is also optimal. You are able to improve the power of k, the power of h from k to k plus one when you move from h1 norm, the h1 norm to the l2 norm. That's the so-called Tobin-Nietzsche's uh, theorem. It's based on a duality argument. It's not. It's not difficult. It's just playing a little bit. It can be shown. Um, the only fact is that you require, of course, you has to be regular enough because you have to have uh, uh, this, uh, this norm bounded. But that also poses a condition on omega. Okay, that poses a condition on omega. Maybe I will mention that just to finish. Um, that condition on omega that you need to go from H1 estimates to L2 estimates is the following. In fact, I can write it more or less in general. Suppose you have a second order problem, LCU equals F. We have seen, we have posed the problem in our case, U in H1 and F in H minus 1. I said that the, this is the space such that functions, F, uh, functions uh, in H1 multiplied by F make that the integral of F times those functions bound. However, what that could be the, the convection diffusion operator or just the Poisson problem. So that for the Poisson problem it works also. However, what happens if instead of having f in h minus one, you have f in L two? You have a more regular f. More regular f. Um, here you could expect that if f is more regular, u will be more regular. You could expect that, right? And in particular, in this case, you could expect that if f is in L2, where do you think u would be? Where? H2. You would expect, uh, uh, you would expect u to be in H2. And in fact, if you are ambitious, you would expect even more. You would expect the H2 norm of u to be bounded in terms of the L2 norm of f. So the, this is the H2 norm of U, and this is the L2 norm of F. Okay? And that, that usually that symbol means uh, a smaller or equal up to constants. Okay? That's, so that's what you could expect. Okay? That's very natural, isn't it? Well, it's very natural, but it's not trivial. So that requires a certain condition on omega. So that happens only in certain situations. For example, that it's known to be true if omega is of class C2. That means that the boundary of omega is a C2 function or a C2 manifold in general, a manifold uh, with, uh, which is uh, twice differentiable locally. Or if omega is a convex polygon, a polygon. If omega is a convex polygon, that is uh, holds also true. So it's, uh, it's a polygon, but it's convex. Okay? If not, uh, it's not true. And that result is sometimes called the ADN theorem. ADN is standing for Arnold Douglas Nirenberg theorem. Arnold Douglas Nirenberg. And it's also called elliptic regularity result. Akmon Douglas Nirenberg. Akmon, not Arnold. Akmon Douglas Nirenberg. Okay? Elliptic regularity. So if you have elliptic regularity, so I just said here that if omega is enough, uh, regular enough, in particular what you need is to have elliptic regularity then that condition holds true. So everything works, everything works, but the only problem is that constant, n over k, which is too large when, diffu when this diffusion is very small. OK, I will talk uh, this afternoon about uh, another topic, because all this is related to global norms, H1 norms and L2 norms of the solution. We will see this afternoon what happens if we want to estimate the solution point-wise. Okay. Okay, so for the moment, it's over.